Remember Hurricane Milton? At the beginning of October 2024, it was forecasted to hit Florida as a typical Category 1 storm. However, almost suddenly, its wind intensity surged, making it one of the most violent hurricanes ever recorded in the Atlantic Basin. Hurricanes approaching the United States usually originate off the west coast of Africa, cross the Atlantic, and strengthen as they enter the warm waters of the Caribbean Sea. Milton, initially a very small storm, encountered record ocean temperatures and warm, moist air in the Gulf, all the ingredients needed to intensify. Milton's wind speed increased by 150 km per hour in about 24 hours, transforming from a tropical storm to a Category 5 hurricane in less than two days. The storm formed as a simple tropical depression on Saturday, October 5th. By the following Monday, it had already reached Category 5, with winds blowing at 290 km per hour. Even though it downgraded to Category 3 when it made landfall on Florida's central west coast, its residual energy was enough to destroy over 120 homes and rip the roof off Tropicana Field Stadium. But that's not all. After Hurricane Barrel in July, Milton was the second Category 5 storm of the season, making 2024 the sixth year since 1950, after 1961, 2005, 2007, 2017, and 2019, to experience two or more hurricanes with maximum destructive power. This small list clearly shows the intensification of the phenomena over the past two decades. So what's happening? Well, it's becoming increasingly evident that there's a connection with ongoing climate change. A recent study calculated that with an additional 2 degrees Celsius of global warming compared to pre-industrial levels, the risk of storms approaching the current theoretical speed limit nearly doubles. This is why there's been persistent talk about studying the extension of the wind intensity scale to Category 6. So, what maximum power could hurricanes reach in the near future? Let's try to understand more. Okay, before diving into the topic, how about a quick review of what we in the Northwest Hemisphere mean by hurricane? For example, have you ever wondered what the difference is between a hurricane and a typhoon and a cyclone? The short answer is, there isn't one. They're all organized storm systems that form over warm ocean waters and rotate counterclockwise around low-pressure areas in the Northern Hemisphere. The reason for the three names is that these storms are called different things in different places. Scientists often use tropical cyclone as a generic term, while hurricane, typhoon, and cyclone are regional terms. In this video, hurricane will be used as a generic term to refer to them, regardless of their location. Hurricanes, as you surely know, also have individual names, just like newborns. For those forming in the Atlantic, this practice began during World War II, when military meteorologists started studying them to understand how ships and planes could avoid them. Initially, they tried various naming strategies, including naming hurricanes after the girlfriends of those who first observed their formation. By 1953, meteorologists began using female names in alphabetical order. It wasn't until 1979, partially due to feminist movement pressure, that male names were also used. Today, the World Meteorological Organization maintains six lists of male and female names in alphabetical order that are rotated, meaning that eventually every hurricane name will come around again, unless the hurricane is devastating enough to have its name retired, as happened with names like Camille and Katrina. Regardless of their names, hurricanes all form over tropical ocean waters, which are the source of their strength. People pay the most attention to them when they approach land, and rightly so, because hurricanes can cause a lot of damage. When fully developed, a hurricane can release thermal energy equivalent to a 10 megaton nuclear bomb exploding every 20 minutes. This might make it seem like they are governed by a purely malevolent nature, but it's important to remember that beyond the potential collateral damage, Hurricanes are part of a vast and complex natural system that makes our planet a place where we can live. They help stabilize Earth's temperature by moving thermal energy from the equator to the poles. So based on what characteristics is a storm assigned that little number we often hear ominously mentioned in breaking news? Hey guys, just a moment before we continue. 
be sure to join the Insane Curiosity channel. Click on the bell, you'll help us to make products of even higher quality. Created in 1969 by engineer Herbert Safir and meteorologist Robert Simpson, the hurricane scale is based on the maximum wind speed they reach. It starts with Category 1, where winds blow at speeds of 119 km per hour or higher. In this case, the risk is minimal, meaning there may be some limited damage to boats, shingles, gutters, and signs. Trees with shallow roots might be uprooted or broken, while damage to power lines and poles could cause power outages for several days. Coastal flooding can occur with water surges not exceeding 1.5 meters above the average level. Category 2, on the other hand, indicates a moderate risk with extremely dangerous winds blowing between 154 and 177 km per hour. In this case, the damage is significant, affecting trees, mobile structures, as well as windows, antennas, and roofs. Coastal areas may experience flooding with water levels rising up to 2.5 meters above the average, necessitating the evacuation of residents. Category 3 indicates strong intensity, with winds reaching 178 to 208 kilometers per hour. Here, we usually see devastating damage such as the uprooting of trees, destruction of mobile structures, and significant damage to houses. Electricity and water may be unavailable for several days. Coastal areas affected by flooding with water levels up to 4 meters above normal, about 3.5 hours before the hurricane center approaches. Category 4 indicates winds blowing between 209 and 251 kilometers per hour. A hurricane of this intensity causes catastrophic damage to buildings, such as roofs and load-bearing walls, and knocks down trees, signs, and road signs. Power outages can last for weeks or months, while coastal flooding, which can occur several hours before the storm center arrives, reaches heights of 6 meters above the average level. The last, Category 5, is the most disastrous, with winds exceeding 252 km per hour. In this case, the damage is severe, with buildings being knocked down, complete destruction of all mobile structures, trees, signs, and road signs. Coastal flooding can exceed 6 meters above normal levels. Most of the affected area remains uninhabitable for weeks or months. As you can see, the Saphire Simpson scale is a simple empirical classification based on the maximum wind speed. However, this simplicity comes at a price. It neglects many other risk factors. For example, the size of the storm. Consider Katrina, which hit New Orleans in 2005 as a Category 3 hurricane, much weaker than Camille, which was classified as Category 5 in 1969. But Katrina's depression basin was twice as large, causing much more damage and many more casualties. The scale also does not account for flooding, storm surges, the sudden rise in sea level along the coast, or the heavy rains that a hurricane dumps when it moves from sea to land. Originally, each level of the scale included a range for storm surges, but the National Hurricane Center removed it in 2010 because wind speed is not the only factor influencing surges. A fast-moving hurricane or one with a wide radius will push more water ashore than a smaller, slower storm, especially if a shallow continental shelf pushes the water mass upward. The surge will also be higher when compressed into a bay like the one around Tampa or when a hurricane hits the coast head-on. Category 4 and 5 hurricanes are, unsurprisingly, among the deadliest natural disasters. In Southeast Asia, Pacific hurricanes killed an average of 740 people per year between 1990 and 1998. In the United States, which is less vulnerable for various reasons, including a less active Atlantic basin, the average number has been 50 victims per year over the last 60 years. However, it's important to note that averages hide enormous variability. A single hurricane, the Great Bola Cyclone, killed nearly half a million people when it hit Bangladesh in 1970. In Hurricane Katrina, which struck the United States in 2005, alone counted for over 50% of U.S. hurricane fatalities. Hurricanes kill far fewer people today than in the past, at least in the Western world. When the Galveston hurricane hit Texas in the 1880s, it caused 8,000 deaths. In comparison, Katrina, one of the worst natural disasters in recent U.S. history, caused 1,800 deaths. 
In other parts of the world, improvements in emergency procedures and infrastructure are needed to reduce the number of casualties, but progress is being made. However, there is little we can do to prevent hurricanes from forming. For example, seeding hurricanes with silver iodide was attempted without demonstrable success in the US-run project Storm Fury. Other ideas have also proven impractical. Instead, we can choose to spend resources on predicting them and building infrastructure to withstand them. Several factors contribute to the formation of a hurricane, and the two most important are sea temperature and the temperature of the air column up to about 20 kilometers high. Generally, the warmer these two elements are, the more energy a storm has to develop into a tropical cyclone. So far, this has set a limit on the size and power of a developing storm. Historically, no part of the globe has had water warm enough for a tropical cyclone's wind speed to exceed about 320 km per hour, and storms that approach this limit are rare. Currently, only 1 or 2 percent of all storms come close to this limit. However, and this is the main topic addressed in this video, when the greenhouse gas content in the atmosphere increases, causing global warming, the limit can rise. According to numerous studies, there is no clear link between climate change and the total number of hurricanes. However, global warming is likely to influence their intensity. This means that the total number of storms may not change much in the future, but a higher percentage of these storms could become hurricanes. According to a study published in May in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, hurricanes are already becoming more intense, with a tendency to move slowly, thus dumping much more rain. Additionally, storms are intensifying more rapidly. So, by the end of the century, if we fail to contain greenhouse gases, the maximum wind speed could exceed 350 km per hour. According to the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory, the likelihood of more intense hurricanes and typhoons forming in the future, with a 2 degrees Celsius temperature increase, will rise by 15%. By the end of the 21st century, we are likely to see more Category 4 or 5 hurricanes and typhoons than we do today. The rains accompanying these storms will probably be 30% more intense and coastal flooding will be more devastating due to rising sea levels. For all these reasons, many experts have been saying for years that a new category is needed to account for the strength of storms induced by climate change. Extrapolating from the current scale, these researchers argue that a storm with sustained winds exceeding 309 km per hour or 192 miles per hour with a substantially greater destructive potential than a Category 5 storm should be defined as Category 6. To support this, they point out that five storms, all occurring in the last decade and some of which proved catastrophic in their impacts, have exceeded this threshold. These include Hurricane Patricia in the eastern Pacific with peak winds of 348 km per hour or 216 miles per hour, which made landfall in Jalisco, Mexico in October 2015, and four typhoons in the western Pacific, Surigai, 315 km per hour or 196 miles per hour, which traveled the sea east of the Philippines in April of 2021. Goni, 315 km per hour, which made landfall in the Philippines in November of 2020, Maranti, 314 km per hour or 195 miles per hour, which hit Taiwan in the Philippines, making landfall in eastern China in September 2016, Haiyan, 314 km per hour, with its deadly and devastating landfall in the Philippines in November of 2013. The communication of a hurricane risk is a hotly debated topic among researchers, and adding a sixth category would be a way to raise awareness about the increasing risks of large hurricanes due to global warming. Other experts partly dispute this data, pointing out that no hurricane in the Atlantic Ocean or the Gulf of Mexico has ever reached the proposed Category 6 level. Moreover, the sighted typhoons in the Western Pacific do not use the saphir simpson scale for intensity assessments. Concerns have also been raised that adding a Category 6 to the scale would increase the likelihood of people underestimating the risks from storms below the highest category. For example, people might choose not to evacuate for a Category 4 or 5 storm perceived as a modest risk compared to a hypothetical Category 6. So who is right? Which side are you on? 
As for me, I can only caution you against taking certain positions too seriously, as they are based on very shaky numbers and manipulated statistics. Science is also about this, a confused debate where the real aim is the defense of careers and hierarchical positions. Ultimately, introducing a new category won't give us any advantage in the battle that certain parts of the world must fight against such a strong and diverse danger. What we need is more satellite monitoring, the ability to convince people to evacuate, and the implementation of engineering works to protect the territory. Nothing more. What do you guys think?